own son is like in witness protection. No address, no number that works anymore. He's a suspect. In the murder? A woman with a problem. You ain't feeling so good. I felt worse. Yeah, yeah, but you felt a whole lot better before, haven't you? I'm done with that. Really? A woman with a past. And a man. A mother cop. He was my best friend. He was doing something that he shouldn't have. And I looked the other way. With a reputation. I used to call him the Terminator. Like the movie? What would you say? That's a violation of my parole. Not if you inform your parole officer and get approval. I'm your parole officer. This is Bernice. Her son's gotten into some mess on the other side. It's not my world. There was this big bust in Nogales and the snake heads get hauled in and Rodney's still in TJ with this new girlfriend. So that's who gets snatched by the chinos. Unless they took a million dollars of your money? You got an army to get it back? I will forget about those boys. What is it you want to buy? An African-American male. My name is Rodney Stokes. We're more interested in the other kind of travel. Other? Like crossing the border illegally. They have an American. So? They're cutting pieces off of him every day. Pretty soon there'll be nothing left. What would you do? Hey, don't you push me, Morenita! How far would you go? Why you hang with me? For a friend. We always say we could go for sisters. The first question I'd like to ask is, was there similarities between you and the character, or one of the characters in this film? Yeah, I, I'm, I think I'm one of the least autobiographical writers I know, <laughs> and, and um, a, a lot of you know the movies that I make and the fiction that I write. Um, the, the, the subjects are, are things that I, I know enough about to be interested in, uh, but don't know enough about so that, that I, I feel like, oh, I've seen that, I know all about that. So um, a lot of times the experience of writing it, doing research, is to, to explore something that I want to know more about. Um, and this particular you know, movie came out of uh, two different movie ideas that I had been carrying around for a long, long time. Um, one about these two women who had been, you know, really, really tight friends, so tight they could go for sisters when they were younger, and then are reunited in this kind of, you know, awkward way later on. And, and is that relationship still possible? Um, you know, can they be friends? And, you know, is this, you know, it's a pretty heavy thing to be a parole officer. Um, you know, that you're kind of a cop and kind of a social worker at the same time. Um, and it's a heavy thing to have that kind of power over somebody else's life. I mean, in that very first scene, um, Fontaine could, could just be taken back to jail. She could have the orange suit put on her. You know, there's always a cop right outside the room. She doesn't know. You know, when she goes in there, um, who she's going to be seeing and what the story's going to be because she's violated her parole. Um, for the person on the other side of the desk, that's a, that's a lot of power. Um, and, and not everybody is totally easy with that power. And after doing it for a long time, it's hard not to get a pretty hard bark on you because people come in and they tell you stories all the time and most of them aren't true. Um, so that was one of the stories. And then the other one was a story I had in my head about uh, uh, a kind of disgraced, disbarred, uh, defrocked you know, detective who, who needs some redemption. And, and you know, how does he find that or can he find that? But um, who, who doesn't have all the tools that he used to have? He, he not only doesn't have the badge, he doesn't have all, of, you know, his physical abilities. Um, and, and at some point I just realized, oh, I could combine those two stories. That would be great if, you know, those two women met this guy and he needs them for certain things. 
like he can't see, um, and and they need him for certain things, they, you know, where he's got some street sense and expertise, um, and and the three of them can kind of have a a third thing that they have to do, you know, an agenda that they have to fulfill, you know, and kind of help each other out on the way to that thing. So yeah, I don't think I don't think I found myself in this except in the way that um, I was an actor before I was a, either a writer of, of fiction or, or a movie maker. And, and one of the things that an actor always has to do is, you know, um, figure out a way to inhabit the character that they're going to play. So one of the things that I do, especially in my screenplays that I'm going to direct, is um, I read them through several times and I play every part. And, and think of, if I had to play this part, man, woman, or child, is there enough there? You know, or does this all make sense? You know, looking at it not as an audience member, but as this actor who has to play this part. And then usually I add a few things to even the smaller parts, you know, just to, to give them a little more three-dimensionality and, and make some connections that might not have been there before. Well, I think you did a great job of pulling those two stories together. Good, thanks. What was the hardest part of filming the film? You know, adapting the screenplay, you know, because you wrote it as well, and mm -hmm. then you had to put it out there. Was there anything? Yeah, I'd say the hardest thing um, was just the practical thing of we didn't really have enough money. <laughs> you know, um, I, I wanted to keep the, the budget way down. I wrote something that I felt like I, I could afford to make, and, you know, this is a self-financed movie. I don't have that much money around. Um, and uh, so, so, you know, time is money, so we only had four weeks to shoot this. Uh, we only had Edward James Olmos for three of those weeks. And so the first week uh, was just scenes that the, the two women were in together. And, you know, then, then uh, Eddie Olmos joined us and, you know, and, and quite honestly, I hate car shots, and this is a road movie, and there are a lot of car shots, and there's not only a lot of car shots where you don't see me, but I'm in the back seat squeezed over, and I'm, you know, not small, uh, squeezed over with the recording gear in my lap, pushing it in and out. Very often, either I or one of the actors is actually doing the slate, and the camera is locked off on a rig, you know, shooting through one of the windows, or Kat Westergaard, our, our cinematographer, is squeezed in the other corner of the car with a camera, trying to keep her own body out of her own shot. Um, and it's, you know, 117 degrees, and you have to have the windows rolled up so that it doesn't ruin the sound. So it's, it's really hot in there while you're doing, and you do a couple takes, and then you roll the windows down and go back to one, and then you, you do a couple more. Um, but without much money that to do all that stuff, to, to shoot a feature in four weeks, you know, we, I think we had 19 days to shoot it. Um, on a road movie, that means that you're moving at least twice, sometimes four times a day. And every time you move, you have to pick up every every vehicle, you know, trucks, whatever, move them to another place, find a parking place for them, wow. you know. Um, so the logistics really were the hardest thing. Um, a quarter of the the movie cost about eight hundred thousand dollars. A quarter of the budget went to um, location fees, because we were shooting um, about three quarters of the film in the Los Angeles area. They've been making movies in Los Angeles for 110 years, so nobody's that thrilled or flattered that you're gonna shoot in front of their restaurant. They're thrilled and flattered that you're gonna pay them $6,000 to shoot in front of their restaurant. And these are places that were picked because they're funky looking, so it's not like you're going to the Ritz or anything like that. You're, you're going to Jimmy's Diner, and he still wants six you know thousand dollars, and then you have to have the police officer there and all the other thing, and the parking might be even extra. You know, you might not be able to park in their lot because they're, you know, you're often not even shutting the people's business down. You're shooting around the fact that they're they're still working. So the logistics of this were really, you know, difficult. Um, finding a crew that was willing to work for as little as I could pay them was difficult. So the um, 
m movie making had had a real dry spot in, in LA, so a lot of people hadn't worked for a long time, and there were a lot of people who said, well, I'd love to do your movie, but if I can get a real job, meaning one that paid better, yeah. um, I have to take that. And so our cinematographer, the, the person who the cinematographer relies on the most is the gaffer who does all the lighting. Um, in four weeks, she had six different gaffers because she would hire somebody and then three days later they'd say, well, I got a better job and I won't be in tomorrow. And uh, to the point where one day she came to me and pointed to somebody and said, is that an extra or is that my new gaffer? <laughs> and I had to go ask the person and say, are you our new gaffer? And she said, no, I'm actually an extra. But if you need help, you know, <laughs> I don't know anything about lighting, but I'll help you out. So yeah, the, the logistics on a, a movie that this is, you know, because I had made, you know, 17 other feature films before this, you know, I could keep it kind of together in, in, in my head, and because the actors were very good, uh, especially Edward James Olmos, um, who has produced low-budget movies, has directed low-budget movies, and, um, you know, with, with Robert Young, has acted in, you know, a half dozen really low-budget movies. He kind of understood and really actually likes that guerrilla filmmaking, yeah, where you're kind of running and gunning and, you know, motorcycle gangs pass through your shot, and, yeah. you know, and he would be excited about that, rather rather than, oh, I can't work this way, and this is distracting. Oh, wow. Let's see. Which one will it be? I want to ask at least one more question, because mm -hmm. I'm sure many other people would like to ask you some questions. Um, which one will it be? What inspires you? What inspires me? I, I you know, um, specifically for this one, um, it, it was kind of that, that, that central relationship between these two women got me really interested. Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't even know they were gonna be African American until I started working on it, and then I realized I know the two actresses who I want to have play this. And then you, you adjust, you know, they went to Compton High School together and, and certain kind of cultural things change. But it really was that idea of two people who, who you know, in that school kind of kid world, could be best of friends, even though they're very different than each other. But there are class differences between them, you know. And then they, life just kind of sends them off in different directions. Um, you know, it can be, you know, friends who, you know, you know, even couples, you know, they, they had kids, you didn't. You know, somebody got rich, somebody didn't. You know, I see this with, you know, actors I know who, you know, uh, used to know, Oh, I, I did summer stock with Tom Hanks, you know, and but you know he wouldn't. I, I couldn't even be an extra in one of his films now, you know. Even though he might remember me, there's that that discomfort with you know. Well, we're just in different worlds now. Um, that happens in things that aren't you know movies or theater or whatever. And and that idea of what well, what's left of that is there anything left there? Um, and that I was interested in this idea that um, the skills that people have might be useful in, in a situation, um, even if they're skills that you're not supposed to be using. So in Fontaine's you know, case, you know, she's actually really good at this. I mean, if she had gone a different way, she would have been a really good detective. You know, she's got a lot of nerve. She can think on her feet, you know, and there's this loyalty that she has that's just part of her character that finally when, when you know, what, 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 it's always nice to see what good actors do with what you give them. And, you know, there's not just the part, I always write um, bios for every character, you know, and it may be three or four pages for the people who have bigger parts. And it's the stuff that's not necessarily in the script, but I think will be helpful to them. Um, and one of the things that, you know, I said is, you know, she really doesn't, uh, she says it at one point at the end, um, she really doesn't think that the son is alive. But she's made this commitment to, to help her friend out. And, you know, early in the movie, she says, if there's anything I can do, she means it. Um, that's who she is. And when she realizes, I think at the end of this, she's going to find that her son has been killed, she's going to need somebody there to be with her. Uh, 
I edited this as well, and as I started to go through the footage, and in 19 days you don't have time to really dwell on the acting or anything. I just felt like, well, you know, uh, Yolanda's doing a great job. It feels good to me, just, just the feeling of it. But when I put her stuff in order, I just realized in every scene, that's really what she's playing. She really doesn't think this kid is alive. But she's watching her friend, and she's going to you know, try to help her out and keep this dream alive as long as she can. And then when the, the hard truth hits her, she's going to be there for her. Um, you know, and boy, was she playing that. So you know, that, that relationship was the thing that really got me in, into it, um, the moment to moment of that, of, of you know, how does this other woman who's got such a hard shell around her, partly because of who she is and partly because of the job that she's been doing for so many years. You know, how does, you know, the minute, you know, she's, she's a stickler for the rules until it's her son. And then all of a sudden, the hell with the rules, you know. Um, you know, and I, I'm gonna pack a gun and if I have to use it, I will. You know, how does that affect her? How does that wake her up? in some ways, and, and you know, what does it mean for her all of a sudden? She doesn't really have that many friends, she says at the end, you know, to actually have this friend who, even though she's from the other side of the law and they, you know, they, they shouldn't be fraternizing. Um, one of the things that Lisa Gay Hamilton um, did when, when uh, she knew she had the part is I said, well, you know, you should do some research too. You know, I've done mine, but you know, you're going to play this person. So, you know, see if you know, you live out in LA. See if you can find somebody who let you ride around with them or whatever. And she, she uh, went and hung a couple days with a woman who was a parole officer for the LAPD, whose actually husband was also a parole officer who had just been shot in the face by a client. Um, so she immediately said, oh. You know, this is not just a social worker job. You can, you know, you know, there are people who, if they go for certain clients, they have backup waiting. Some of them carry guns. Sometimes, some of them actually will wear stuff if it's somebody who they're really nervous about or who hangs with people that they're really nervous about. And the first thing the woman said is, "Well, she'd have to recuse herself right away. You know, if you have any contact with a person in the back, good, good or bad, you can't do it." When of course she does that, but then of course when she needs her, she says. Well, maybe I still am your parole officer for you know as long as it takes. And the other thing is, they had just changed the regulation. It used to be you told the person to go into the bathroom and come out with their urine sample. Now you have to be in the room with them. And I, and the minute I heard that, I just said, well, well, that makes a really, really, really embarrassing re-encounter between these two women. Of you know, just got to stand there and watch you urinate into a cup. Um, you know, it's hard to recover from that if you're the person urinating. Of you know, you, you've just you know, you're, you're really there with your hat in your hand saying, please don't judge me, please don't send me back to jail. Um, that, that moment to moment working with actors and seeing them work those things out um, is a lot of what, what inspires me, is, is once I know some characters that I'd like to, you know, employ thinking of, okay, what actors, you know, can help me do this? Um, because it, you know, it's, it, because I also write fiction, I, I do the thing where you get to be God and you do it yourself. You know, um, you can make the sun shine, you can, you know, have an army full of soldiers and tanks and planes and you just write them down and you don't have to pay for them or feed them lunch. Uh, but in a movie, um, you have, you know, practical things that you can't do, um, but you have this team of people who have skills that you don't have. And, and my favorite ones to work with are the actors to, to, you know, they're not changing lines, but they're bringing stuff to it that I didn't even know was there. Um, a good example is, uh, I just, you know, said in the bio for Edward James Olmos's characters, you know, Detective Suarez has this, you know, macular degeneration. And then I said in a, in a phone call with, with Edward Olmos, I said, okay, Eddie, it's up to you how serious it is. You have to play this. You know, I'll read a little bit about the disease, but you have to figure out for your character how affected he is. And when he came in, it was like he's in the last stages of it. You know, so the the one thing I was able to do for the actors is the first scene that we did in the movie was the two women meeting each other again, and then we shot out of sequence for a while. But then the first day that Edward almost um, acted was the first scene where they encounter him, and the two poor actresses are like, are th "Is this guy ever going to look at us? Can we get any eye contact?" And then they realize, "Oh no, he's blind." 
you know, and it affects, it affects the body language, it affects the way they deal with him and everything like that. And that was a choice that Edward brought to it that I really liked and just kind of encouraged him to keep doing it, you know. And he's really consistent with it. He really, you know, worked on it. There's points where he kind of half bumps into things and, you know, and he really felt like it helped him um, one of the things that I didn't want is for this detective to come in and be the, you know, the, the knight in shining armor who solves all these, these two women's problems. He can't be. You know, he, he, you know as he said, you know, I, I shot up in the air. I didn't even see the guys I was trying to shoot at. You know, I, I'm, I need you guys. Um, you know, you may be a pain in the ass and do things I don't want you to do, but I can't get out of, you know, the parking lot without you helping me. They all need each other. They do need each other, and and that acceptance of, you know, you know, it's always a risk to to let somebody you know you need their help because they may not want to help you. You know, yeah. Well, ba basically, it's it's that this is a you know this is a serious kidnapping that you know you know may be more to scare other people who mess with them rather than actually expecting to get paid off and get money. So we see his finger cut off, you know, fingers cut off earlier in the movie, and then we hear from, uh, you know, one of his, you know, cohorts that his ear has been cut off. Um, and, you know, it's, it's just to, to, to remind the characters, but also the audience, that this is, you know, there, there's a time limit on this, of, of the patience of these people, and that they're serious about it. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know, life or death in that case. And it's also for, for I think, for him, um, you know, this isn't, you know, a rich kid who's just been kidnapped and these people have a lot of money. This is somebody who they may just decide, oh, there's no money yet, let's just kill him. You know, no witnesses. Uh, the, the question is about, you know, uh, uh, building up empathy with the son. The son really is kind of, he's even a bit of a mystery to his mother now. You know, when she goes into his apartment, she says, well, we used to do this, we used to do that. You know, she was a single mother, and that was the main relationship in her life. You, you see her call, and he doesn't call anymore. He's got his own life. Um, so there is, in, in a way, um, he's like Fontaine. He's a friend from long ago in her life. Maybe not as many years, but, um, you know, the, who is he now? You know, and there is something left, you know, when, when, when he opens his eyes and, and says, Mama, it's like he's a little kid again. But we're, you know, he's kidnapped and he's out of the picture. So there's no way we're going to really get to know who he is. The most important thing is he's her son. Oh, yeah, they, they, they actually say it in the thing um, when, when they're doing the cheerleading thing. The, the red and the gray is, is Compton High School. And they mention, you know, they, the cheer mentions Compton. Um, yeah. So, um, have you worked with Yolanda before? No, it's interesting. I, um, I had worked with um, uh, Lisa K. Hamilton, uh, was in our, our movie uh, Honey Dripper. And when we were uh, auditioning for that, um, Yolanda Ross came to read for the same part. And I just felt like, well, she's, she's really good, but she's too young for this. Um, and just not the right feel or whatever, but I put one of those, you know, whenever I cast, I put, boy, work with this person someday. So when I was writing this script, I just thought of her, um, and she's somebody who um, actors know who she is and say, oh, God, she's great, but she just hasn't had that much work um, that, that, you know, she, she had a little couple episodes of Treme a couple years ago and, you know, little parts and this and that. And she actually started, um, late into acting. Uh, she was playing, she, she did an HBO movie, uh, called something like The Stranger Inside where she played a teenage girl. I think she was 20 years older than the character she played, uh, in prison. Um, and I saw her in that years before, but um, just a terrific actor and a, and a terrific person to work with. Um, they didn't know each other, so they emailed each other a couple times. Um, but actually, you know, I think they, they kind of said hi, and they really just started 
you know, knowing each other as they work together, which is not bad for people who are supposed to not have seen each other for years and years and years and years. Um, you know, actors come in off of a plane and get dressed and say, oh, here's the woman who's been your wife for 25 years and have to deal with it and, and work out a relationship. So I at least was able to, you know, kind of reintroduce them together and then they, they really helped each other out in, in a very tough shoot. The, the thing that I like the best about it, of course, um, in the editing room is the relief of, yeah, the acting is that good because, you know, in 19 days you don't get to do many takes. Uh, you th we could turn the air conditioning on, um, you know, when they weren't acting, so it was always cut, and then they turn that air conditioning up, and, you know, they get two minutes of relief, and then we'd, we'd do another one, but... Uh, yeah, I, I, I generally don't do a lot of takes. Um, I don't rehearse, um, so the a lot of what I rely on is good actors who really inhabit their characters, know who they are, know their lines, and then the shock of the new. Uh, one of the hardest things that actors have to do is if they're doing 10 or 15 takes of something from three different angles, that's 45 times through a scene. By the 45th one, it's tough not to know what the person is gonna say next. Um, so it's actually sometimes actors like you know, not doing too many takes, and they can really, they, if they know that, they can really throw themselves into the takes that they, they are doing. Um, it, it made Lisa Gay really nervous <laughs> because, you know, when I told her that was really good, we're moving on to something else, she wasn't sure, you know, that it was. And, and I just had to keep saying, you're doing fine. When you're not doing fine, I'll let you know. We'll just keep doing takes until you do a great one. You know, but other actors are just say, oh, great, we're done. And thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you very much. Thanks so much.